Hi, good afternoon or uh, good morning, everybody, depending on where you're uh, digesting this from. Um, my name is Bradley Campbell. I'm the President and Chief Operating Officer of Amicus Therapeutics. Uh, and I want to thank you all for joining me today. And thanks also to ARM for giving us the platform to, prevent, uh, to present. I hope everybody is doing well in this uh, virtual world. So I will refer you to our safe harbor statement. I will be making some forward-looking statements today. Amicus Therapeutics is a fully integrated global uh, biotechnology company focused on developing next generation therapies for rare and orphan diseases. And we have a snapshot here of, of who we are as a company. Um, on the upper left hand side, we highlight Gallifold, which is our approved uh, small molecule for the treatment of fat brain disease. It's really the cornerstone of, of our success at Amicus. Um, down in the middle there, we have ATGA, which is our next generation biologic in phase three development for, for Pompe disease. And I'll talk just a little bit about those two programs. Uh, but where I'll, I'll spend most of my time is really on our gene therapy platform, uh, which is where we take our protein engineering and glycobiology capabilities and combine them with some great technology and collaborators in the space of gene therapy. And that really leads us to what we think is one of the most uh, robust gene therapy portfolios in the industry, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, we do have global commercial capabilities. We're present in 27 countries around the world. Uh, and we do have two clinical stage gene therapy programs in CLN6 and CLN3 bat disease. And, and we'll talk more about that as well. So as I mentioned, Gallifold is a small molecule. It's a chaperone, uh, which is designed to bind to and stabilize a patient's misfolded protein. Uh, and specifically for patients with certain amenable genetic variants in the GLA gene. Through that stability, it allows the patient's misfolded protein to traffic out of the endoplasmic reticulum into the lysosome where it can then turn over a substrate. And that mechanism, I think, is, is part of the evolution of who we are, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, we did do 62.4 million in global sales uh, for Gallifold in the second quarter, and that's on our way to 250 to 260 million in expected sales by the end of this year. Uh, we're, we're approved in 40 countries around the world. And importantly, at the end of last year, we had over a thousand patients with Fabry disease who took Gallifold uh, for the treatment of their Fabry disease. So that's really the cornerstone of our success at Amicus. Our product that's next furthest along in development is ATGAA uh, for Pompe disease. And that's the combination of a next generation enzyme replacement therapy that was specifically designed with optimized carbohydrate structure to ensure optimal targeting to key tissues in Pompe disease. And it's combined with or co-administered with a chaperone that acts as an enzyme stabilizer to keep ATP 200 properly folded and active in the circulation during the infusion. We show really interesting and compelling data in a phase one, two study uh, of ATGAA that showed in particular in six minute walk test, a uh, 60 meter improvement in naive patients and a 40 meter improvement in patients switching from standard of care to ATGAA. So very exciting and compelling data in the phase one, two studies. We're now well underway in our phase three study, our PROPEL study, uh, which is a registration directed study for ATGAA, and that's in late onset Pompe disease. That's on track to show data in the first part of next year. Uh, we've also announced plans to begin the rolling BLA this year and the second half of this year, and then we'll hope to complete the submission after we get the data uh, in the first half of next year. And we have a number of expanded access programs as well to try to maximize access to ATGA for, for multiple um, persons living with uh, Pompe disease around the world. We do have a gene therapy program in Pompe as well, and, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So our evolution into gene therapy, which is where I'll spend the majority of the conversation now, uh, I think makes sense based on where we came from. And again, if you think back to the chaperone, where there we were really focused on stabilizing naturally produced enzymes, endogenous enzymes within uh, patient cells, also had to really understand biological pathways, protein trafficking, and generally development in the lysosomal storage disease space. As we moved into Pompeii, we, we sort of took that same knowledge and applied it now to stabilizing and really now targeting externally produced enzymes to, again, optimize uptake into cells, um, focused on carbohydrates and under other ways to make sure that we were getting the enzymes into cells. And that's really the backbone of our, of our ATGAA program. 
And we took all of that combined knowledge as we were thinking about then getting into gene, gene therapies and, and now focused on stabilizing and targeting internally produced enzymes that are, that are expressed via gene therapy. So a natural evolution of the, of the science and technology, each building it on itself. And that's really led us to, again, what we think is one of the most robust uh, gene therapy portfolios in the rare disease space in our industry. Um, again, we have our Fabre uh, program with Gallifold and Pompeii with ATGAA, but we also have gene therapies and those two, two indications. We have a robust franchise in bat disease with two clinical programs in CLN6 and CLN3 that I'll talk a lot more about. We also have a, a program in CDKL5 deficiency disorder, as well as M MPS programs, and, and then rights to a host of other um, uh, lysosomal storage diseases through our collaboration with Dr. Jim Wilson and, and Penn. So drilling down on the, the Batten franchise, this came to us through the acquisition of a company called Selenex that was spun out of Nationwide Children's Hospital. And that's really um, the technology that Dr. Brian Kaspar invented that went on to become Zolgensima, which of course is now approved for SMA. Um, that same technology was spun into a company called Selenex and really, was really primarily focused on bat disease and, and delivering AAV gene therapies uh, intrathecally to the CNS to address this family of, of um, childhood neurological disorders, collectively called bat disease. And our lead two programs coming out of this, uh, this acquisition were in CLN6 and CLN3. Um, bat disease generally uh, is a broad family of these really challenging neurological diseases that primarily affect uh, uh, children and young adults. Uh, in the case of CLN6 bat disease, uh, patients are generally born relatively normal, and then by the age of two or three, they will rapidly lose their ability to walk, to think, to see, and to speak, and they typically die, unfortunately, in the first decade of life. Um, there are no approved therapies for CLN6 Batten disease, so a huge unmet medical need. And we estimate there's about a thousand patients uh, who are diagnosed globally with the disease. Although, of course, like many of these diseases, uh, we expect uh, that CLN6 is underdiagnosed. So, just looking a little bit more closely at the natural history of, of CLN6 Batten disease, here we're looking at two domains of the Hamburg scale. And the Hamburg scale is, is a four domain scale. It looks at motor, language, cognition, and vision. What I'm showing here are motor and language. Uh, for each domain, there's a zero to three score, three being full function and zero being no function. And what you can see here, and this is so typical of, of CLN6 bat disease, this is 11 patients in this natural history cohort. In the first two years of life, as you can see, generally full function on these two domains. And then after that, you see this rapid fall off in both of the domains, about one or two points a year, to the point where by about seven or eight years of age, they've really lost all function across these two domains. So really a rapid fall off and, and, and tragic disease course if left untreated. What I'll show you next is the results in the first eight patients of our clinical study, a total of 13 patients, but eight of the first that we had data for. And what you can see here, and this is the combined scale for Hamburg and, uh, excuse me, the combined Hamburg scale for motor and language. And what we've oriented this is patient, the patient on the upper left was treated at the youngest uh, age and then uh, progressively down to the patient who was treated at the oldest age, patient five. And what you can see, we think very clearly, is that treatment, this one-time injection, AV delivered intrathecally into the CNS of a CLN6 gene therapy, shows clear stability in these patients, in particular in the patients who are treated at a younger age. So looking at patient seven across to patient six, you know. Uh, certainly stability may be slight improvement in, in that first patient, showing that if they're treated early, you can maintain um, that function along those two domains. And even if you look down in the patients who are treated a little bit older, patient eight, one, and four, it does seem to be there too. You're seeing some stability if you compare it to, again, that natural history where you were losing, you know, one to two points a year. Um, so we think very profound impact. And, and sometimes I think stability uh, seems like you're just maintaining sort of disease um, uh, or preventing disease progression. But the reality is as these patients age in order to stay on this, this scale, 
know, they may be also gaining motor milestones. We know a number of these patients ended up in mainstream kindergarten. So a very profound effect we think on the disease, especially if you can intervene early. Uh, we will be showing the full data set from all 13 patients at the child neurology conference later this year. Um, and so very excited to see uh, whether we're seeing similar impact on, on a broader number of patients there. I do want to drill down one other place though here from this data set. We were able to get access to the natural history of some of these patients' uh, siblings. Unfortunately, many of them uh, expired before the trial was initiated or didn't qualify for the study. Um, but what you can see here in green is a treated sibling, one of the patients that I showed on the previous slide. And then in red, their untreated sibling. And, and I think this just shows profoundly, again, how, how rapidly this disease progresses without treatment and how with treatment we're able to stabilize the, the disease. So very encouraging, and we hope to show, again, more data uh, in the fall. Turning over to CLN3 batten disease, we actually have a clinical study underway here as well. Uh, this is in four patients, three at a lower dose, one at a higher dose, again, AV delivered intrathecally. Uh, for the CLN3 uh, gene therapy. Um, and this is just showing our preclinical proof of concept data. On the left-hand side, you can see reduction in storage material. Uh, the next graph, you can see improvement in motor function and cognitive uh, behavior. Uh, you can see survival uh, there, maintaining strong survival. And then we also show uh, expression uh, in a broad number of tissues in, in non-human primates. But they're, you know, I think great preclinical data. And that led us to, to starting this study will show data from these four patients, at least initial data at a Congress that was scheduled for the end of this year, but now actually I think it's in January. So exciting to see that first, uh, hopefully proof of concept as well. So really exciting progress in Batten disease. But let me turn now to our collaboration with Dr. Wilson. And again, the idea here was obviously Dr. Wilson is 200 um, plus scientists, bring great expertise and experience in vectors, tropisms, capsids, you know, how to deliver these gene therapies, where to deliver them, what target, what, what tissues to target, but also kind of profound and broad foundational gene therapy work on safety, on dosing, immunology, et cetera. Bringing all those capabilities, but combined with amicus is very unique protein engineering and glycobiology experience, our, our deep clinical and regulatory experience, and then hopefully eventually, of course, leveraging our existing commercial infrastructure all around, again, that 50 plus diseases, both in lysosomal disorders, as well as some broader diseases as well. And they're looking to drive one to two new INDs every year, starting next year. <clears throat> now, the great news is we've already demonstrated some proof of concept from this collaboration. And before I go there, I'll, I'll just tee up kind of the, the lay way that we think about um, uh, the importance of this, this combination of these two technologies clearly where the gene is delivered, how it's delivered, which tissues you're targeting is a critical part of gene therapy. And again, Dr. Wilson brings so much experience and technology to bear there. But if you think about all the work that goes into a biologic, yes, the production of that biologic is so critical, but there's a ton of work also that goes into downstream processing. In particular, making sure the key quality attributes, and if I think about Pompe disease, it's making sure the carbohydrate structures are, are preserved as you go through the manufacturing process, that's just as important as whether or not you can make the protein effectively. We feel like this is the same uh, case for, for gene therapies and understanding the protein that is expressed, how it's targeted, how it remains stable, where it goes within the body is just as important as how it's delivered. And that's really kind of the approach that we've taken these, to these diseases. And again, we have generated some uh, proof of concept preclinically. The first chart I'll show you is just kind of that foundational notion that if you look at a naturally um, expressed protein delivered via gene therapy versus our engineered constructs delivered by the same gene therapy at the same dose, what we're showing here is in the red line, it's the naturally expressed protein. The blue line is the engineered uh, protein delivered by gene therapy. You can see significantly higher enzyme activity in Pompe disease, Fabry disease, two of the, the batten diseases, CLN1 and 2, and then, and then one of the uh, NPS diseases. So very clear improvement in enzyme activity at the same dose delivered by the same vector in these um, proteins. We did translate that to proof of concept in a Pompe mouse model. 
uh, with our engineered form of GAA. And on the left-hand side here, uh, this is in CNS uh, in the spinal cord. You can see um, uh, in the red, or sorry, gray is vehicle, so untreated animals. Red is the naturally produced enzyme and blue is the engineered enzyme, GAA. You can see a significant improvement in glycogen reduction in the spinal cord. We saw similar results in the brain. And then importantly, in, in quadriceps, which is you know, perhaps a, the hallmark uh, tissue in, in Pompe disease, you can see again, strike, strikingly better uh, glycogen reduction in, um, in these Pompe mice model with the engineered protein. And importantly, this was done at a low dose, uh, 2.5 E to the 12. And you know, if you think about you know, one of the most challenging things we're facing as an industry is how do you strike the right balance between uh, delivering an effective dose and safety, especially in these um, systemic diseases, systemically delivered gene therapies. And we think producing a much more potent gene therapy using some of these protein engineering capabilities is one way to, to solve that issue. <clears throat> Likewise, we've, uh, we've now produced similar uh, proof of concept in Fabre disease. This is in a Fabre uh, mouse model. It's a slightly different approach though. Here we've engineered a much more stable form of the GLA gene. And so on the left-hand side, you can see the naturally produced GLA through the gene therapy rapidly losing its activity over time whereas the engineered form stays fully stable, fully active out to the, to the length of the experiment. That translated to significant improvement in enzyme activity uh, in the middle panel there, and then significant uh, improvement in substrate clearance as well. So very encouraging proof of concept in Fabre, and we hope to have more data here uh, later this year as well. So uh, I'll just end on some of our um, some of our milestones for our gene therapy portfolio through the end of this year, again, showing the full data set from the CLN612 uh, study uh, in, the, in the Congress in October. Um, I didn't talk much about manufacturing, obviously a huge focus, but we are on track now. We've, we've tech transferred from Nationwide Children's Hospital to uh, Brammer Thermo Fisher uh, and are on track to be able to produce material at our commercial scale that we'll use to treat more patients uh, in what we hope will be registration-directed studies in both CLN6 and CLN3 disease next year. Those, both of those indications have um, a fast track and orphan, shoot, a fast track and orphan designation by the FDA. Um, I mentioned the Pompeii gene therapy progress. We've actually declared a clinical candidate and we're looking to move into IND enabling studies. We hope to have one more clinical candidate declared this year in another indication. Uh, and again, that leads us with uh, seven preclinical gene therapies in development, and then of course, two clinical and, and bat disease. So lots of exciting progress. I know it's, it's both an exciting and challenging time in the gene therapy field, and, and I wish you all luck, uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the Congress. Thank you.